Things are not always what they seem to be, are they? I realize this week I'm kind of focused in on the book of Esther, Gila, because Purim is this week, and uh, you know how that goes. And so it's in my head, and it's in my, it's in the front of my mind right now. The beauty of the book of Esther to me is that there is a depth to it that is seldom explored. There is an understory to the book of Esther, to the story of Esther, that we almost never get. Um, I can tell you in all the years that I've sat through sermons and like, if they ever talked about Esther, we didn't get into those things. It was a very superficial story about how to trust God and God will put you in the right position and almost never mentioned that God doesn't appear in the book of Esther. No mention of him at all. There's some implied things, but, but no mention of him at all. The book of Esther is almost Machiavellian in its political machinations. If you understand what's going on from the opening words, what's going on, it is a remarkable story of things that we don't understand because we're not paying attention to them. We get the story that we want, but we don't really grasp the subtle undertext of what's going on. What is that subtle undertext of what's going on? Well, there are a number of ways to look at it, but I think one of the more interesting ways that I've hit upon in the last 24 hours is that it is literally a story of deterrence. What is deterrence? You may be asking, what do you, what do you mean, Dave? Those of you that have been around me long enough to have seen me in uniform know that on my uniform, I wear that emblem. It's called the SSBN Deterrent Patrol Pen. That is not mine. Mine actually has a gold star and a silver star, or gold and a bronze star, uh, not three bronze stars. Uh, I made six patrols. The gold star is for five, and the other one is for one, and there you go. The patrol pen indicates that I made a deterrent Patrol. And when we talk about deterrence in today's world, we tend to think of things like Minuteman missiles flying from bases in North Dakota over the pole. Uh, we, we think about things like the B-52 and the Strategic Air Command, which is still a great movie. If you haven't seen it, Jimmy Stewart's Strategic Air Command movie, I highly recommend it. This idea of instantaneous response in the, in the event of an attack by an enemy, which we also... In my world, think of things like SSBNs, ballistic missile submarines, and the fact that these submarines were used to build a credible deterrent to any enemy who might be thinking about attacking us. We also had the element of civil defense in that. Hopefully, some of you may be old enough to remember duck and cover drills. My wife and I were laughing about them yesterday. The, uh, the, the, the turtle, you know, who has... He carries a shelter on his back, but you have to find shelter. You have to go out and do things that will protect you from, you know, what's going on. This idea of deterrence was this, this massive theory that if you show strength in the face, face of the enemy, he, the enemy won't attack you. This is best portrayed in what seems to be a, a non sequitur axiom. If you want peace, prepare for war. Most people who would classify themselves as peace people, we want peace, we love peace, would not agree with that. They would say, if you want peace, work for peace, dis dismantle weapons, particularly weapons of mass destruction, get rid of them, and in that vein, you can work for peace. But history tells us something differently, doesn't it? History tells us that weakness, displayed weakness, invites attack. And regardless of what we want to be, it tends to be that way. And here's the remarkable thing about that. You can go through all of history. 
and find that over and over again, perceived weakness. I was uh, talking with uh, Alex this morning about some Sun Tzu and the fact that the, the idea that everybody thinks that their military is so strong that they're, that their military is strong enough to ignore the deterrence of the opponent because it'll be a quick, short war. And it never is. It never is because it's a fallacy. If you want peace, prepare for war. And this is something that people don't want to think about. They'd rather think about, uh, you know, we're, we're stronger, we're better, or we're conversely, the thought process seems to be, well, we're much more advanced than those people. This is a remarkable thing through history. Dave Nabhan, who's a good friend on Facebook, I've had him on the show before. Dave wrote several books about earthquakes and earthquake preparedness and, and prediction and don't want to have time to get into all that. But Dave likes to talk about how scientists and, and beliefs and philosophies of the past seemingly are better than the ones we have today. We think of ourselves as so advanced. We think of ourselves as so much better than the way things were 100, 200, 300 years ago that we find ourselves in a position of being able to rationalize that, well, that won't happen to us. We won't do it that way. I've been talking a lot lately about 1914 and the eve of World War I. And as we sit on the, you know, well, we're past it now, but as we were sitting on the eve of Ukraine, I kept bringing that up. This was... It was so eerily similar to, to 1914. It was so eerily, bizarrely the same because somehow or another, these, we weren't seeing the parallels and it was, it was annoying me. It was driving me nuts because it was so obvious to me, but how do you get people to see it that way? How do you get people to see that the reason Putin is pulling this off is because very simply he senses weakness. I don't really care why you think he senses that weakness, but he does. At literally the same time that is happening, you got North Korea. The Norks are throwing weapons. You know, they're, they're throwing SSB or ICBMs, sorry, into the air. And the Chinese are making absolute threats about invading Taiwan. Why? Because they sense weakness because they sense this idea that somehow or another there's an ability here a lack of a credible deterrent and that means that there's impunity or at least a sense of impunity for being able to do it now what am i talking about with deterrence it's easy to think of it in terms as i said of of sac B-52s and, and, and Minuteman missiles and, of course, ballistic missile submarines. It's easy to think of it in those terms. But it's really so much more than that, isn't it? I don't like to use Ben as an example because someday he's going to watch these and he'll be embarrassed. But Ben has this habit. He has this fascination with plastic water bottles. You know what I'm talking about? I don't even have one on the desk. But, um, yeah, I do. I do have one. Sorry. You know, you know these plastic water bottles like that? He has this fascination with taking these water bottles, half full, he'll drink some of it, and, and then he will throw it as hard as he can at the ground. Oh. Now, the first time he did this with me, I looked at him and said, what are you doing? Don't do that. Don't do that. Do not throw that water bottle at the ground. Now, I don't really know why I, I cared. I really don't. I mean, in the big scheme of things, is he's an 11-year-old boy. Does it really matter that much if he's throwing water bottles at the ground? Maybe he likes the noise it makes. I don't know. Maybe he's trying to get it to explode. I, I don't know. I'm pretty sure I probably did something similar. I couldn't. If, if you ask me to analyze why I don't want him doing it, is it the waste, the potential waste of the water? I, I don't know. What I do know is I told him, don't you do that again. And a few days later, he was standing outside, and he had a water bottle in his hand, and he cocked his arm back. And I could have, at that moment, said, don't do that. But I didn't. He threw the water bottle at the ground. And it made a noise, and he laughed, and on we went. The credibility of my deterrence when it came to water bottles with Ben is, is non-existent. 
I can say it to him now, don't do that. And he'll basically look at me and say, why not? What are you going to do about it, Dad? Now, he doesn't say that, but but you get the idea. The, the thought has to enter his head that, well, he's not going to punish me for it. I, why can't I do it? Deterrence is so much more than just nuclear weapons pointed at each other going, if you shoot a nuke at us, we're going to shoot a nuke right back at you. It's so much more than that. It, it, it covers so, so very, very much. When Saddam Hussein pulled his stuff, when he invaded Kuwait the first time, and then he continued doing things the second time, we used in some sense an act of deterrence to invade in 2003. Now, the problem with that, of course, is that there is a great deal of belief that it's that invasion that led to where we are now, which is that Vladimir Putin is pulling his stunts because the United States was distracted and so forth and so on. I don't know if I believe that or not. I don't know if I accept that or not. I also know this. At the time of the Gulf War, the second Gulf War, the second invasion of Iraq, well, the first invasion of Iraq, the second war with Iraq, I know that the vast majority of the people in this country, if not around the world, were in favor of it when it happened. It isn't until several years later that the push against it becomes galvanized and history the subtext of history is rewritten in some ways. It's, it's easy to read the surface of the, the explanations as to why. See, George Bush lied about weapons. Bush lied, people died. And therefore, uh, you, you draw a straight line from that to Putin's invasion of Ukraine because, you know, the United States lost its moral authority and blah, blah, blah. That may or may not be true. There may or may be some truth to that. There may not be. The problem is we're reading a very superficial line of text, a story on its very surface, and we're not asking the deeper questions about what's going on. We're not asking the deeper questions about deterrence, about how, do, how could we have deterred Vladimir Putin from doing this? Now, look, I'm, this is not a discussion of Donald Trump. It's not a discussion of whether you like Trump, hate Trump, whether I like Trump, hate Trump is irrelevant. But there was a perception in the world that Donald Trump was much like Nixon in the sense that that man's crazy and he might do some things. And so when Donald Trump was in office, we attacked an airfield in Syria where the Russians happened to be doing some stuff. And for three years, Vladimir Putin was dead silent. The Iranians were getting a bit, <laughs> the word for it, uh, big for their britches, doing some things, attacking Saudi Arabia, some things. That we, and Donald Trump authorized the killing of a, a, a Revolutionary Guard general. And the Iranians pretty much went flatline after that. It was almost this perception. Donald Trump walked into North Korea. Now, you, I don't care if you like Donald Trump or not. I, I really don't. There is a certain deterrent element to having a leader who seems willing to take the actions that stand up to people that need to be stood up to. In 2014, when Donald Trump was not president, Vladimir Putin invaded Crimea. Coincidence? I don't know. The best way to prepare for war or to prepare for peace is to prepare for war. The people who wanted the reset with Russia let Russia invade Ukraine. The person that didn't want to reset with Russia, but is being accused of being buddy-buddy with Russia, said, don't do that, and they didn't. And now the people who still wanted the reset with Russia are back in power, and Putin's invading Ukraine. Deterrence only works if you're willing to, to, to do something about it. Deterrence only works if it's credible. It only works if the person you're seeking to deter believes that you're legit. The other problem that we have, of course, is that the text that we're reading, the stories that we're reading, are 
untrustworthy? Listen to somebody griping today about the media, about how untrustworthy it is and so forth and so on. And it seems to be a, a mantra of the political right. I will tell you that. I've listened to other shows where they've said the same thing. It's no wonder callers to shows repeat the same thing because they're hearing it. So they repeat it because it's, it's what they think. That somehow or another media today has become completely unreliable. Media has always been unreliable. Media has always been subject to influence. More than 100 years ago, Mr. Hearst and his newspapers essentially drummed up a war over the explosion of the battleship Maine in Havana Harbor. There was a great deal of what, was, what would become known as yellow journalism in those days, and, and, and still was. It's no different in the sense of what media is trying to do. It is trying to influence you. This is what media, regardless of what kind of media it is, and I don't care if it's a podcast, I don't care if it's a newspaper, a news program, a, a, a website, a Facebook post, a Twitter post, it doesn't matter. The effect is the same. It is attempting to influence how you think and how you do things, and at the same time to discourage you from thinking any differently about things. It is desperately trying to win your heart and mind and at the same time stop you from thinking about the deeper meanings of the text that you're seeing right in front of you. Vladimir Putin has invaded Ukraine. Why did he invade Ukraine? You can argue all you want that it's, it's Trump's fault, must be Trump's fault. And there are people who are telling you that each and every day of your life. It's Trump's fault. Or maybe it's Obama's fault for not showing strength. Maybe it's the American people's fault for not reelecting Donald Trump. I don't think so, but I'm sure there, there are people who are willing to make that argument. The bottom line is Vladimir Putin invaded Ukraine because there was no credible deterrent for him to do so, for, to, to him to not do so. There was no credible enforcement. There was no belief in his mind that anybody of anything important could do anything about it or would do anything about it. And the bigger question of the text is, why does he believe that as opposed to why did he invade Ukraine? The reason he invaded Ukraine is because he could. The question we have to answer is, why did he think that he could? And much like the opening lines of the Megillah of Esther happened in the days of Artaxerxes, as the way you would say it, Ashaverosh, that Ashaverosh, who reigned over 127 provinces from India to Nubia, dot, dot, dot. And we read that and we go, okay, in the days of the king Artaxerxes, Ashaverosh. And how many of us stop to think about the meaning, the deeper meaning of Wait a sec. How did this guy get to be king of Persia? What effect does that have on the text that follows? The story that follows? Is he doing the things that he did? That allow other people to do the political machinations that they do? The deeper text, the deeper understanding we have of why does Vladimir Putin believe that there is no credible deterrent is the question we should be thinking about. But, as usual, we're not. We're not.